What I want you to tell me about now is the, uh, the next phase of your journey, which is the breakup, because there's always something new on the horizon, isn't there? Yeah. So. Well, the Monarchs, as a show band, we realised was not going to be for us, right. for, for about five or six of us. And uh, we decided, with Van's influence, that we wanted to be a rock band, primarily. Yeah. A lot of blues through Van's father's collection, which was massive. He was bringing this stuff around, we were learning it. And just about that time, there was a couple of guys came over. One was a singer, one was a drummer. And we knew a manager, they said, let's get over to Scotland. Now, at that time, we were working, right? And it was taboo to give up your job. Go professional. <gasps> what were you Never working on? I was a post, I was a telegram boy, and then I was a postman. Lovely. In early days. But I remember I was telling you about my father saying it was a load of old rubbish, the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. He nearly took rickets. He nearly went berserk when I give up your job. What are you thinking about? You see? And yeah. during the time when I told you that he thought it was a load of rubbish, yeah. the skiffle period, I went round to a hall with the group and my sister charged, I think it was three threepens or threepens at yeah. the time, to get in. And all the neighbours came in to hear our five songs we'd learned and my father came round cap on, sat down, took his cap off and listened. And at the end of it, everybody was all clapping, you know, from the neighbourhood. I said, well, Dad, what did you think of that? He said, it was all right. And this, this particular words or phrase that he said to me has stuck with me the rest of my life. And in actual fact, I'm going to have that as the title of a book I'm writing. He knew nothing about music, but he watched me on stage and he turned around and he said, it was very good. But you'll never get anywhere playing that owl you And that's the title of the book. You'll never get anywhere. So needless to say, when I gave up my job, he went oh. berserk. Yeah. But we said, this is what we want to do. And we all gave up our job, Van Morrison, everybody. And we got on the, the Glasgow boat out of Belfast. We've yeah. still got photographs of it, actually. And we headed out in the boat. We arrived in Scotland. And the guy was down to meet us, the so-called manager, with 68 weeks' work. He had a weekend of work, and we had given our jobs up. Oh. Now, that was the start of what we would call uh, starving for your art and music, yes. because we did. Yes. We lived in his council house in Pollock in Glasgow with him, his wife, his four kids, and his mother-in-law, and six of us in the one house. And it was during the summer. We had to get out into the garden to get somewhere, and we started playing out in the garden just to amuse ourselves. We said, what we're going to do, we're going to have to do some. We're young lads, never been out of Belfast. So we started driving around Scotland, picking up gigs. Right. So we started, we got a gig, okay. and we got a gig, we were able to eat. Right. So to cut a long story short, anyway, we eventually got gigs, and we started playing. And our last gig before we made the decision was the Beach Ballroom in Aberdeen, which is still there, right. and show bands have all played it. And we decided on that night that we were going to go to London. That was our big decision. Right. And you may ask why. We were so naive, we simply thought that if you went to London, you would make it. You would make You'd it. get discovered. Because and, and Van wasn't the singer in the band? Yeah, Van, no, Van just played saxophone. He, he sang a few songs. Did he write anything? No, never. He was writing a bit of poetry, but never did we dream he was going to be a song, uh, songwriter. Yeah. So we went to London, Stephen, with all our money, pulled it together, and we starved for two weeks in London. Where did you stay then? Well, we, we didn't know anywhere in London. We had never been out of Belfast, yeah. as I keep saying. We drove around the West End because that was the showbiz place. Oh, so we said, if we drive around, somebody will discover us. You know what I mean? <laughs> right? <laughs> That's how naive we were. And uh, the Beatles were just starting to break, come out. You know, I'm talking about 61 62. period, 62. Yeah. And for two weeks, we starved with nothing. We dipped our fingers into cremola foam and drinking chocolate to live. Yeah. And we got moved on from car park to car park because the police started knowing us. We're, we're, we're like car. vagrants. We're sleeping in the minibus, six of us. But now this next story I'm going to tell you as part of this, you're not going to believe, because it was pure fate. I was about to ring home, because uh, my father, I told you, he drove lorries, he was a sort of furniture remover. He was the only one on our street with a phone. Right. This is way back. And I knew that if I phoned him, told my mother, she'd maybe get his money over to get his home and give it all up. And we were just about to do that, and we're walking around Leicester Square, and we bumped into this guy who we had backed on a couple of gigs in Scotland. His name was Don Charles. He had a one-hit wonder called The Hermit of Misty Mountain. Crept into the charts and crept out again yes. quickly. He said, what are you guys doing here? What? What? I, I says, well, we just came down to London to think we were going to make it. He says, are you mad? 
you know. So he took us to the Wimpy Bar, which was the forerunner of McDonald's. Yes, yeah. Of course, sparks were coming out of the night before. We were eating away, I guess. He says, I'm going to help you guys, because you've got a good band. And he took our suits. He says, where's your suits? And the suits were like accordions. You know, they're all been folded up. So you would have been wearing suits when you're playing? When we're playing, all had band suits, but they were all crumpled up in the wagon, you know, with the rest of the gear. He says, I says, what are you going to do with those? He says, I'm going to take them to get cleaned. I says, get cleaned? What are you talking about? He says, one hour cleanest down the road. And I says, one hour, get out of here. Yeah. We were from Belfast. It was three days to get suits cleaned in those days. Yeah. He came back with these suits and polythene bags. I'd never seen polythene before. The yeah. way I says, that's fantastic. They're right new. Yeah. Took us into Hyde Park, made us hang from trees, did publicity shots. Yeah. He says, I'm taking those to my agent. She loved the band. Started getting his work around the American basis where she thought we'd be suitable. Yes. And within three weeks to a month of us about to go home, we were sitting on audition to German club owners with 10 other bands. Your trip to Heidelberg mm. was, uh, this was a, a pivotal point really, wasn't it? If it had gone one way or the other, the consequences of it, of you going back home or being disillusioned? We, Heidelberg in Germany was a big step for us, but I, I suppose the main pivotal point, as you call it, was the fact that we could have gone home if we hadn't met that one guy in the blue, out of the blue, Leicester Square, among thousands of people. Do you not think yes. fate played a part? Because I think if we had gone home, we'd have probably dispersed in the other bands and not stayed as the monarchs. Because when we went to Germany, which was the American sector, even Vaughan started to experience American GIs, black guys, who were very blues oriented. They used to come and jam with us. And Vaughan's whole life changed because they're looking at his father's albums at home in East Belfast. Yeah. He was suddenly playing with black guys. Yeah. So it really motivated him, I think, that he wanted to be blues and blues only. But so you, had a, you had a number in the charts. Yes, I had a, with a hit record in 1963, got to number five. I sang it. Uh, in the with, German? Uh, in the German charts, yeah, in 63. And uh, we still have copies of it today, funny enough, in Van, and we all meet up in East Belfast and we sort of laugh at it because it was called Boozoo Holly Gully. <laughs> wonderful title but it got into the charts but we didn't know until we come home that it had yeah. gone into the charts yeah. but we came home I joined show bands my mother kept saying it's about time you earned money and Van went back to London and I knew that he had this attraction for the big blues scene and then he came back to Belfast and tried to coax all of the monarchs to start a band and play only blues but by that time we said no we've starved enough we're earning good money now and he went around found a band formed them and the rest is history. Yes. And that was all around that one point, because we had gone home yeah. and not gone to, to Germany. I don't think any of us could have afforded even to go back to London again. But one of the great influences in your life has always influenced you, even to this day, yeah. was, was the fabulous Ray Charles. Absolutely, and that came in Germany too, when the American GIs taught us all about Ray Charles, and then we realized that what, how he was called the High Priest of Soul, yeah. and he was just my, my idol. Also R&B, wasn't he? He was like... Oh, he could sing anything, country. Yeah. He could sing ballads. I can't stop loving That's you. That's right. Yeah. He, he actually surprised him. He went country, didn't he? Yeah, he, but he, he, he knew that he had to open up his whole spectrum of music. And, you know, over the years of being on radio and broadcasting, I met many, many great stars. And I said... I don't say that flippantly. It's been an honour to do it. Yeah. But there's very few people that I would put the tag of genius on. And he was a genius. Well, will you give us a, a, a snippet of genius here? And, and, and <laughs> You're asking me to emulate a genius here. <laughs> well, look, <laughs> yes, why, not, why not stay up there at that height? You know, oh, well, OK. Give us a Ray Charles number. I'll give you one of my favourites. It was also recorded by Eddie Cochran, the great rock star. And it's called Hallelujah, I Love Her So. George Jones with Hallelujah, and I Love Her So. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Let me tell you about a girl I know She's my baby and she love me so Every morning when the sun comes up I said She brings me coffee and my favorite cup Yes, I know, man, I know Hey, hallelujah, I just love my baby so When I'm in trouble and I need a friend I know she'll stick with me until the end People smile and ask me how I know I say uh, She's my baby and she'll love me so Yes, I know, man, I know Yeah, hallelujah, I just love my baby so Hey, but when I call her on the telephone, baby Say, honey, listen, I'm feeling all alone, child 
by the time I count the one, two, three, four, I hear her on my door. But in the evening when the sun goes down and there ain't nobody else around here, she kisses me and then she holds me tight. She says, hey, pretty baby, everything's all right. Yes, I know, man, I know. Yeah, hallelujah, I just love my baby so Tony Boy, hey! telephone baby I said you listen honey I'm right here and I'm all alone child by the time I count to all them numbers I I hear her on my door but in the evening when the sun goes down and there ain't nobody else around yeah she kisses me and then she holds me tight she says hubba hubba baby everything's all right yes I know her Man, I know, hey, hallelujah, I just love my baby so, uh, hallelujah, I just love my baby so, hallelujah.